is Totally 80s, the podcast dedicated to the music of the greatest decade ever. So, turn up your Walkman, loosen that scrunchie, and get ready to talk 80s with your host, Lindsay Parker. Hi, I'm Lindsay Parker from Yahoo Entertainment and Sirius XM Volume, and this is another episode of Totally 80s. If this is the first time you're joining us, why not take a second to follow us at Totally 80s on Facebook and Instagram, or email us your comments and show ideas to podcast at totally80s.com. You can also check us out on video as well on our Totally 80s YouTube channel. So check that out if you are so inclined. And joining me today is the screaming to my Lord Byron, John Hughes, Bowie File, extraordinary. <laughs> I'm enjoying your fashion because you are wearing, especially for this occasion, a Bowie's yeah. t-shirt. So am I. So I think we've sort of uh, spoiled what the subject is today. But if you listen last time, you already know, because this is part two of a two-parter about David Bowie in the 80s, because there was no way we could really with a, put the whole decade into one podcast. There was just too many career highs and some career lows. So obviously, we are not absolute beginners when it comes to today's topic, and neither is our special guest. He is an author, music journalist, longtime contributing editor to Rolling Stone, author of several fantastic books, including one actually about David Bowie titled on Bowie. So we are pleased to welcome back to the show for more Bowie goodness, the one, the only Rob Sheffield. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you for coming back and joining us. There's so much to talk about, so much to unpack, and there's no one I'd rather talk about. There's no one I'd rather talk about Bowie with than the two of you guys. So let's pick it up where we left off. I, I'm about to say something that's actually kind of embarrassing. I heard the Ziggy Stardust version by Bauhaus before I heard the David hey, Bowie version. Hey, I thought yeah. Tom Petty sang Rebel Rebel. So okay, actually, yeah, I, that's worse. That's actually worse. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I didn't think it was their original song because back then VJs and DJs did used to back announce things. So I remember Richard Blade actually saying this is a big hit right now in England. It is a band called Bauhaus doing a cover of Ziggy Stardust. So I was very aware, you know, when artists covered, you know, even if it was like Duran Duran covering, you know, Cockney Rebel, I knew. So actually, Bauhaus was very instrumental in me. Um, I was well aware of Bowie at the time, but like I've already said, I kind of kind of only knew his current stuff. I knew his 80s stuff and the tail end of the 70s stuff. I did not go all the way back to the beginning. Bauhaus introduced me to Ziggy Stardust and kind of opened this Pandora's box of me discovering all the early 70s stuff by Bowie. So then when The Hunger came out and it stars David Bowie as a sexy vampire, and it the best opening sequence in cinema with Peter Murphy in a cage. I always like seeing Peter Murphy in a cage. I was a very big fan of that Ziggy Stardust video. I'm just saying. Um, I mean, that was just sort of connecting the dots for me. And like you know, as I was saying, you know, the so many of the bands I liked in the '80s all drew such a direct through line to be inspired by Bowie. And I think that movie. I mean, when I watch that movie, The Hunger Now, I'm kind of like, okay. It's a little long, kind of like the blue jean video it goes on a little too long, but yeah, well, that I think it's a perfect movie. Also okay. in terms of like a really great movie, it reminded you that the eighties was all about people smoking cigarettes in hospitals. <laughs> so <laughs> much smoking cigarettes in the hospital in that movie. God bless the eighties. But that sequence though, and David Bowie being this like elegant vampire, even when he got old, it's kind of weird to actually watch the movie now, you know, now that he's passed and that we got to see him age, to see him age in a, in a, in accelerated, that's part of the plot of the hunger. Sorry, if people haven't seen it, but when he ages right. like yeah. really fast in that like waiting room in that doctor's waiting room and he's, but he's like this hot older man, but that opening sequence with at the club, a club that I would have, been so happy to go to if it existed like what do we think in general about about this movie i think guess rob you said it was like a perfect movie so yeah i completely love it a, a, a career peak for everybody involved um, <laughs> like the first 15 minutes best intro to any movie ever clearly like you don't expect a movie to get much better than that but it's like oh yes saturday night let's go to the goth vampire club and like Pick up a, a you know a couple, take them back to our little estate, drain their blood in the in the bathtub after some gratuitous nudity. Um, it just like kind of all too Bela Lugosi's dead, like one of the many 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 great genius Bowie imitations by non Bowie people. You know, one thing about Bowie, he was always great at picking up 
other people's Bowie imitations and using them to augment his own Bowie glow. Um, and, and Hunger is just a fantastic movie. Absolutely. John, do you have any hunger thoughts? We call that a Friday night in 1985, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, what can you say? I think Rob said it all. I think the hunger gets unfairly overshadowed by just the sheer goofiness of Labyrinth, which is amazing. You know, you've got kids all dressing up as Jareth every year for Halloween. Still, no one dresses up as Bowie's character in The Hunger, which is a shame. I think that someone happened. should have at the Moonlight Roller Ring right? costume contest. If someone had done that, I would have absolutely said they needed to win the prize. Well, let's talk about Labyrinth for a minute because I don't know if you guys went to the Brooklyn Mu uh, Museum when they had the Bowie exhibit. You probably did, Rob, because you live out in New York. I was visiting there. Um, I'm pretty sure this happened at that exhibit. I get confused if it was at that exhibit or the Jim Henson exhibit that happened here in LA. So Rob, you might be able to clarify. Was it the one in Brooklyn where they have the letter from Jim Henson to David Bowie saying, Hey, I have this part of gobble. I'm paraphrasing, yep. but that's gotta be the Henson one. Okay. So when I went, okay. So now I remember. So out here at the Skirball Center in Los Angeles, they had uh, about a year and a half ago, this uh, not so not long after the Brooklyn thing with Bowie, they had a Jim Henson exhibit that had like, you know, everything from Sesame Street, The Muppet Show, all the films, puppets galore. And it was very emotional. It was very cool. But the only time that I teared up was behind glass. They had this letter from Jim Henson, handwritten, that was sent to Bowie that said, basically was the pitch letter saying like, Hey, I'm working, I'm paraphrasing what it said, but basically, Hey, I'm working on labyrinth and I have a part for you. And I think you'd be perfect for, it. and I, here is the script. It was the letter that was on top of the script. And I just started crying because both, you know, obviously Jim Henson and David Bowie are dead. And to see that it all started with this handwritten note. And that was the note that was affixed to the script. And like Bowie got the script, read it and was like, all right, sign me up. I presumably he, you know, this is what did it. And it was a direct, you know, pitch from Jim Henson. And this is the other end of the spectrum. Cause obviously we're talking about hunger, which is not a movie that's child appropriate. And, you know, but the labyrinth is definitely, I think for people of a certain age, that is what got them into Bowie for sure. And um, they also had some of the outfits at the Jim Henson exhibit as well. So let's talk a little bit, John, about, and Rob about, you know, how this movie and I'm not remembering exactly what year it came out. What year did 86. this come? 86. So it was, this was before Never Let Me Down or the same year? Right before. Yeah, before. Yep. Okay. Same time as uh, Iggy Pop's Blah, 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 which we'll talk about. Okay. So we're doing, I'm doing good with keeping the chronology right here. Yes. So how did this movie, uh, which like I said, was completely different from The Hunger and different from a lot of things that David Bowie had done and was a movie, you know, it was for all ages, but obviously it was a movie with with a young audience in mind. How did this sort of expand, you know, David Bowie's legacy? It was a flop. Was it? It did not do well. It did not do well in the box. Office. Time. Totally. Wow. Uh, and you know, the singles didn't make the top 40 singles, you know, you had underground didn't, you know, again, that mid sixties shuffle that he was kind of stuck in at that point. Uh, you had magic dance, which is amazing. There's a really cool 12 inch mix of magic dance out there. Uh, didn't do anything. I don't even think that charted. So it, it was, it, it was nice. It was cute. It was like, Oh, he's doing Peter and the wolf again. You know, that kind of reaction from the fans, I think. But hmm. you know, Labyrinth is one of those things. It's like I melt with you. Flop when it came out, classic now. It's so interesting, yeah. the revisionist history, or maybe not revisionist history, but the ongoing history, because not only do we, you know, think of that as, you know, um, a great Bowie cinematic moment, but Jennifer Connelly was in it, and she went on to have such a big career. So I did not realize that well, it was... That and Dark Crystal. People think Dark Crystal was this huge, you know, top box office draw. That was a flop, too. Henson was not. What about Never Ending Story, which wasn't Henson, but similar? Was that a flop? You're crushing my world here with all this, these facts. Rob? What about, Rob, were you, were you a fan of, the, of Labyrinth no. at the time? No, everybody laughed at it and thought it was a stupid move. We, we all missed the boat on Labyrinth. It was future generations who adopted that as their Bowie. And it it was really only when he died that I realized that for almost all my friends under 30, this was their David Bowie. It was, it was it's yeah. almost like the like the idea of like I've 
it's almost like being an Alec Guinness fan before he was in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And like the world changes. So literally everybody first sees Alec Guinness when he's Obi-Wan Kenobi. It's that kind of thing. Everybody's first Bowie at this point is from Labyrinth. And that song became, a, I mean, that movie became a classic on a way that nobody predicted at the time. Nobody wow. saw it coming at the time. It, it, it just became a, a classic. Oh, yeah, the hair and, was fabulous. Sorry, and, John. And the, I was going to say that Tina Turner hair, which he was get, he was kind of got goofed on, and the pants. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Talk about spray a paint. Choice. The choice was made. Yes. <laughs> choices. Well, he made some interesting choices in the '80s, as we said. Some some maybe didn't make sense at the time and make sense now. Some totally made sense at the time. Some did not make sense and still don't make sense. That's and that brings us way to blah blah blah. <laughs> well, yeah, but you mentioned blah, 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 John. So tell me what you wanted to say about, about oh, that. It's a lost David Bowie album. I know it's an Iggy Pop album, but it's a David Bowie album. David produced it. David's all over it. David's singing on it. it David's writing on it. It's a David Bowie album. It is a glossy commercial David Bowie album, Iggy Pop album, because, it, again, the story of blah, blah, blah is, hey, I had this great hit, Iggy. Isn't money great? You should have some money, too. I know. <laughs> Isn't money great? Yeah. <laughs> that should I have been the title of the album. Isn't money you're, great? You're borderline living on the streets. Let me help you out. I got some people. And you have uh, a really good choice for a first single, Cry for Love, which is more of a rock song, not really a, a, a heavy stamp of Bowie there, more Iggy. But then you get into... Real Wild Child. And, and that was a hit, from what I recall. You know, hit ish. Uh, and it was on K Rock a lot here. So to yeah. me, it felt like a hit. But then you have things like the title track, which is just, is just insane. If you ever hear that, it's like, oh, we got a Fairlight CMI. Let's see what we can do with this thing. <laughs> and we're going to sample Bowie going blah, blah, blah over and over. And it's, a, it's an amazing record. I'm not saying it's a good record, it's an amazing record. What's a better record? Blah, 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 or Never Let Me Down? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay, Rob, do you have an opinion on that? If you have to choose a would you rather game? I, 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 I can't, I can't make that choice. <laughs> Some okay. choices are harder than others. Well, yeah. as, as we've said, I've been building up to it throughout this whole podcast, you know, uneven, but you know, a lot of career highs. Tonight was a bit of a, a fumble, you know, squandering some of the success and momentum of let's dance. But then, and what year would this have been? 87, Never Let Me Down came out. The, uh, the non-prophetically titled Never Let Me Down. Speaking of videos that felt long, Day In, Day Out made dan the 20-minute dancer for Blue Jean look like a TikTok in comparison. That just fe that felt, how long was the Day In, Day Out video? Because that felt like it was an hour long. Seven minutes, mullets, <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> roller skates. Baby's being kidnapped. Windows being smashed. It's Does he fly? Does he float? I think he floats. He he he's, he's on the roller skates. Okay. All right. Yeah, well, it, roller skates. I've already established that roller skating and Bowie. You know, I, I. That's fine. But this was definitely. I guess what I'm trying to say is when tonight came out, there was that part where it's like, okay, this isn't as good as I hoped it would be. This isn't as good as Let's Dance or the stuff, obviously, that came before Let's Dance. But, you know, I'm cutting in some slack. And then the next record came out, and it kind of just continued that trajectory of it just not being his best work. And that was when it was kind of like, okay, let's. that's when we, I, at least I started to think, like, okay, Let's Dance was a fluke or it was his last hurrah. Rob, correct me if you remember this differently, but I remember the party line when it came out was, hey, all right, I got the top 40 out of my system. This is me getting back to being David Bowie now. And you've got Peter Frampton on board playing guitar, and you've got, uh, you know, songs like Day In, Day Out, which are the strangest top 40 song, I think, of his career. When you listen to it, it's not a very poppy song. Um, there's kind of a chorus. Is there a chorus? Yeah, Day In, Day, day In, um, Day Out. That's it. That's then you go. have the, the title track, which is actually – you know, kind of transcendent. I love I that. do. I do like that song because I remember that when he did the glass spider tour, which I do believe maybe to your point, uh, John, about how this was like, Oh, I'm getting back to my roots or whatever you are. I'm getting past my commercial thing was the glass spider tour was this big production that, you know, obviously had the word spider in it. It was like, just by calling it that it connoted the idea that he was returning to the theatricality of his, you know, earlier work. And I do remember, I did go see that tour. Susan, the band, she's another band, obviously owes a debt to Bowie. 
opened up. I remember being very excited about that. And I remember enjoying it. Obviously, it was Bowie and it was a wide ranging set list. But that song, the title track, there was some ballet. There was a ballerina who danced in it. She was famous or she became famous for a moment. Like MTV did a week in rock segment on her. I, I cannot remember her name. The ballerina at the Glass Spider Tour who danced, you know, to this very pretty kind of um, very sweet song. Never let me down. I did. I do remember enjoying that. But yeah, what are your memories of this? Uh, the Here's tour the and the memories of it. Um, for me, it's 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 the vision of him sitting in the giant dis disembodied hand and like basically talking on the phone, uh, lip syncing. Uh, because of the the effects and choreography, there was no variation night to night. He was basically like he he just like kind of like locked himself inside this super expensive coffin of a show. Yeah. Um, just uh, absolutely. It's one of those things that comes on every few years. Uh, you see it late at night on, on some music channel and it's just, it's transfixing like how many terrible decisions per minute are made and how they're also the most expensive possible terrible decision. Um, and it, it's, it's really, and it's really far from what people wanted from Bowie at the time. I mean, tonight you Tony, Tony tonight. Basil did choreograph it. I just want to interrupt you because she oh. had choreographed the Diamond Dogs tour and she did choreograph this. Okay. So maybe that's why I have fond memories of the dancing because she's the goat. But Who? go on. Tony Basil, she she choreographed this. But go on, Rob, with what you were saying. Sorry. Well, it, tonight it's the kind of thing where people expected better. You know, people bought it because they thought it was going to be Let's Dance Again. It was just a year later. Never Let Me Down. It was the one where people were wary and and... They didn't like the last record. They didn't like the hit. They didn't like the tour. They didn't want to investigate the album. And this was one where it just seemed like David Bowie had really kind of almost overnight become one of those out of touch pop stars who puts out an album every year. It was almost like a you know new Roger Daltrey record or something. Uh, like that. Well, I did actually just consult her handy Wikipedia because I did want to see if this tour was a success commercially or critically. And the answer is no, but it did say that, you know, according to what I'm reading here, that he did have a goal for this tour, which was to return to the theatrics of the 1974 diamond dogs tour, which is why he broke brought Tony Basil back into the fold. Obviously he had a history with Peter Frampton uh, that went back well before 1974. They went to school together and he brought Peter Frampton on. And from what I recall, kind of like how he sort of helped uh, Nile Rodgers a little bit by bringing him, you know, rebooting his career uh, uh, post-disco by bringing him on for Let's Dance. We didn't even talk about with Let's Dance about how he really like kind of introduced Steve Ray Vaughan to the world with that, with that album. But in general, the idea of using his platform to help someone Peter Frampton was not doing so well at that time, you know, career wise. And so I remember at the time that Peter Frampton was brought on for this record and this tour, it was kind of like Peter Frampton was very grateful for the opportunity. So there was like a lot of like, oh, he's returning. He's bringing in old people he used to work with. He's returning to old aesthetics. I remember being excited for it. When you guys saw it, did Peter Frampton have a solo spot when you saw it? That's probably when I went to the bathroom, but I believe so. I believe I remember seeing it in Cleveland and I think Peter Frampton had a, like, I don't know if he sang a song or if he just had like a guitar solo, but it was like, ah, you know, we're kind of here to see David. Can you move aside, please? Maybe he had a talking guitar interlude. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever let me now? Yes. <laughs> You've been the highlight. I'm sure, I'm sure after hearing like, you know, an hour of, of never let me down deep cuts, oh. people would have been super psyched to hear show me the way. Cleveland would have Cleveland would have exploded in rapture. Do you feel like we do? Yes. Exactly. Wow. Well, I think after this, Tin Machine was needed. That's what I was going to say. So, if I'm not mistaken, so after let me never let me down, let us all down. Despite the fact that you know it, there might have been some good intentions behind it, or some cool people brought into the fold to sort of attempt to, I don't know, recreate old glories. It didn't work, and so then. He, that was his last album of the 80s under his own name, correct? Under the name David Bowie. And then he ended the, in 1989, he ended the decade with Tin Machine, which again, I think was a lot of people, as you mentioned, John, sort of this idea of like, oh, I'm, I no longer care about 
commercial success. You know, now I'm just going to do what I want and I'm going to get together with all these all stars and form a super group. And I remember being excited about this one too. And then it was, there were moments. There were, what do we think about Tin Machine? The album they put out, the first album, the one that came out in 89, that sort of was the bookend to his like uneven decade. Two great songs. Okay. Uh, Under the God and I Can't Read. And there's no coincidence that those are the two songs that end up on every single compilation. <laughs> I, I I would agree. What about you, Rob? Yeah, I I, I don't even like those two. Um, <laughs> it's the kind of thing where like choosing between the two Tim Machine studio records is almost like choosing between blah 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 and never let me down. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> the, the, those records also like it, it, it had the sense there was definitely the sense in the late '80s that David Bowie was trying too hard, which is something mm. that he never seemed to be doing before. Uh, he was obviously guessing out loud about what the kids were into. And so the crisis in confidence was really on the surface. It was kind of like embarrassing. That was around the time that uh, he began becoming bearded Bowie for a while, which yeah. was, it, it just showed a lack of confidence in his brand. Well, I'm, but okay, that's what we're saying now. Maybe my impression or my hindsight, my vague memories of this is are different from yours but i remember at the time obviously this was a super group and we had the sales brothers who had a very illustrious resume we had reeves gabriels who now plays with the cure another band that owes a debt to bowie i remember at the time this idea that bowie had gonna okay my last couple records didn't really work and now i'm going to do this super group with these like very respected players i remember at the time people being excited about it I remember oh, yeah. the time people wanting to like, it. I remember like CMJ, I remember being like a college radio thing. And again, the sort of idea that David Bowie was going down a, a, a more art, a less commercial path, shall we say there was excitement about it. Right. How was it received at the time? Did people think it like it now people talk about it and no one's like, Oh wow, that was great. But at the time I seem to recall, maybe it was just critics wanting to like it. People yeah. wanted to like it. It was, it was journalists going, Oh, he's doing something that's not, overtly commercial and he's trying to to get back to something and it was a little bit of trying to force feed it um via rave reviews and articles i remember uh from such esteemed uh publications as <clears throat> rolling stone uh which is great um but i listen to it now i actually kind of understand and like it it and this is going to be one of my goofy bold statements that i make on this podcast every so often it kind of presaged grunge Really? Listen to that record now. Uh, the What was missing, what Kurt Cobain had, what Pearl Jam had, hooks. But if you listen to the <laughs> structure and how the songs are really just kind of in this really sludgy production, it's not Butch Vig, but it's Butch Vig-esque, huh. if there's such a, a ver, uh, an adjective. Listen to it again, and you might be surprised. And this is, if you're really a Bowie file and you're going to go deep, Check out the performance on uh, SNL when Tin Machine was on Saturday Night Live. It's great. And you're really? like, wow, okay, I missed something here. Now, that's me watching it in quarantine, <laughs> you know, with nothing going on. So, you know, buyer beware. But I just watched that a few weeks ago, and I was like, how did I miss this? And it, it's really good. Well, that's a very, very bold statement to make, John. So I'm dying to know what Rob, who's already made it clear that he's not like the biggest fan of the Tin Machine era. Like, what do you think about this assessment that it was sort of like a grunge forerunner? I, I, I love the hotness of that take. It is <laughs> at, I'm blistering my hands on the hotness of the take. <laughs> it's just like grunge, except without songs. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And you get it. With, <laughs> yes. Um, I, you know... It, it also, Lindsay, you're very generous calling this a super group. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> if, if this was a super group, you know, checkered past was the traveling Wilburys. Oh, <laughs> you know, I'm friends with Michael DeBar. Sorry, well, Michael. I love checkered past. I you love okay. not one. You got I was one. about to say that checkered past was a much more successful in this mode than Tin Machine. Okay. okay. When, I love the Michael DeBar's era of Power Station. Yes. I go all the way with Michael DeBars. Okay. We got not one, but two sales brothers in Tin Machine. Come on. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. All right. That's um, semi super. Semi super. I kind of, it, there was a sense, you know, Bowie, he was talking about what he was trying to imitate at the time was Dinosaur Jr. Yeah. And 
it was like, okay, you know, like that's kind of a cool idea, but you know, Dinosaur Jr., they have songs and, you know, and Tin Machine just didn't have the songs. They just had this sort of, there was a sense that David Bowie was imitating the kids in a way that, you know, was very not true to the Bowie spirit. So you think about, yeah. you know, you mentioned The Cure, you know, they made, you know, Disintegration in 1989, a classic Bowie-esque record. If you're looking for a great 1989 record in the Bowie mold, you didn't go to Tin Machine, you went to Disintegration. You went to the Pixies Doolittle, you know, like 1989 was a record full of great Bowie clone albums. Actually, 1989 in general was like a great year for what uh, at the time was called, I guess, college rock. I mean, that was, you know, when I think about 1989, I think about, you know, the Stone Roses. I do think about Disintegration. I think about, you know, Love and Rockets having uh, the Pixies. I think, oh, I mean, didn't Pretty Hate Machine by Nine Nails come out yeah. in that year, no. obviously. And we go back to the term turntable hit, where Under the God got to number nine on the modern rock chart. <laughs> What's a turntable hit? What's a turntable hit? I don't know what that turn that well, term I means. Like to explain to the group what a turntable turn hit. What's a turntable hit? Not on the record. No, <laughs> uh, I think Jet, John is maybe implying that there was maybe some some goodwill involved. Uh, I know. I, okay, <laughs> I understand. I understand. Its presence, on, its presence on the charts and on the radio is maybe not inspired by genuine consumer interest, but maybe. A handshake in a in a dark alley. And Lindsay, I see. Wait, let's say I call Georgia and I say, "Hey, can you find some voting?" <laughs> Someone called a record company and said, "All I need is eleven thousand seven hundred eighty-nine All, All I need is eleven thousand seven hundred eighty ads. <laughs> okay, oh, I gotcha. I gotcha. So, okay, so as we've established, you know, David Bowie started the decade strong, had many peaks, many lows didn't necessarily end the decade so high, but he, inf whether, you know, whether it was sort of a moment where it felt like he was maybe not deliberately, but by circ circumstantially passing the torch to other people who like all the artists we mentioned that were starting to kind of make better Bowie records than him, like everyone from Cyndi Lauper to Prince to the Cure, whether he put out his best work in the eighties, that's up for a debate. Some, sometimes yes, sometimes no, but his stamp was all over the 80s the new romantics all the new waivers i mean i you, it could be easily argued that all of the bands the new artists that came out in the 80s that we loved from morrissey gary newman soft cell you know uh, uh duran duran spando ballet uh boy george of course would kind of probably have not existed if they hadn't all watched that top of the pops episode with starman it seems like that was there Ed Sullivan Beatles moment. So can we talk a little bit about, you know, at Bauhaus, obviously I've already mentioned Tom Schilling with his major Tom song that he claimed that he'd never heard. Peter, the, uh, Peter Schilling. Space Oddity. Peter, Peter Schilling. Sch I, say, I said, did I say Tom Schilling? Close enough. Major Pete. Whatever. The one here wanted Peter Schilling who did the song Major Tom. Yeah. And he, did he not claim that he never heard Space Oddity, that, that he, that wasn't a sequel, an unofficial sequel? Originally, but no, he's he's come around now. He admits okay. it. Now. I'm glad. I'm glad he finally, you know, became an honest man. But let's talk a little bit about the, throughout this entire conversation that we've had about Bowie in the '80s. So many other artists have, some of which I've just mentioned, have kept popping up. So, is it safe to say that he was the most influential artist on? the artists that came up in the eighties, all of the new wave artists, all at least the British ones, like what's, what's his influence there? Uh, well, if you're if the blitz kids, hundred percent, any, any kid that was at the blitz, uh, that started a band, there'll be the first, Gary Newman, who famously was parodied on teenage wildlife by Bowie himself. Um, you know, for, for taking his low shtick and, uh, making a career out of it. And, I think it, there's a great uh, podcast that Gary Kemp uh, started where they talk about, they interviewed Boy George last week, and they talk about when Bowie came to the Blitz to kind of check everything out. And the the Blitz thing was to be so cool and not care, and he's old guard, and they couldn't help themselves. They were just out of control. So that shows you the influence he had. And, okay, Rob, hot take number two of the night. Bowie influenced himself in the 80s. It has a happy ending with Tin Machine because the guitarist for Tin Machine, Reeves Gabrels, ends up sticking with Bowie for the next 10 years, doing some really adventurous, different stuff with Bowie. Uh, you say what you want about Earthling. 
I'll defend it. Uh, say what you want about outside. I'll defend half of it. Um, <laughs> but at least he was trying something. I think he saw what was happening and said, all right, I got to do something. So there's kind of a happy ending. Maybe. Rob? Well, what? We, we all agree he made great records in the 90s again. Uh, love Earthling, Love Ours, which a lot yeah. of people don't like. Um, it, a lot of that is, you know, something that happened around the turn of the decade was he met this woman who he married. Mm -hmm. and, and like at the time, everybody was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rock star marries model times, you know, like rock star marries model of the week. That was a fairly trite narrative at the time. However, it completely changed Bowie's life. It changed his music. He began to care again after mm -hmm. owning in these records in, in the late 80s. He, he, he began writing, you know, unbelievably beautiful love songs. Earthling, which nobody noticed because of all the drum and bass glop that was sort of pasted on top of it. Just like a fantastic album that like that Iman inspired. And what really like the happy ending of his life is, is that, you know, he was inspired to make great music again, not whether it was commercial, not whether it was popular. He was no longer imitating the kids. He was no longer guessing what was popular. He's making music from the heart again. Absolutely. But to take it back to the 80s to wrap this up when we're talking about imitating the kids or the imitating him, what do you think are the best cover songs, particularly 80s cover songs that um, that were done of Bowie? I, of course, have already sort of spoiled my choice. It's Bauhaus's version of D Ziggy Stardust. I think not just because I heard it first, because I just think it, it's just perfect. It's absolutely my number one Bowie cover. But lots of people have covered him over the years. When he passed for for Yahoo, I wrote a whole list of like the best Bowie covers, and it, it incorporated all decades. It of course incorporated, you know, obviously, a lot of people think of "Man Who Sold the World" by Nirvana, but that's that's a '90s one. But are there any other like '80s covers that spring to mind for any of you? Or they don't have to be '80s, I suppose. We can. If we're taking '80s out of the equation. Uh I love Aurora's version of uh, Life on Mars. Okay. Girls soundtrack. If you've never heard that, she's uh, from Stockholm, I believe. And it's, it's really sparse and affecting. It's Bjork basically covering Life on Mars. And you, Rob? The other, the other great uh, pop visionary of the 80s, uh, Prince, uh, the very last concert of his life, him solo at the piano just a few nights before he died. What song does he do? He does Heroes. Oh, you watch that clip and you don't just like weep your eyes out. What are you even doing with having eyes in the first place? Why do you have, why do you have lungs? <laughs> the idea that like Prince like made this beautiful contact with the spirit of David Bowie in this incredibly beautiful, heartfelt way. Like just unbelievably beautiful tribute from one great visionary to another. Wow, that is pretty amazing. And then I'll wrap it up by asking you, what do you think is David Bowie's best song of the 1980s? And if it's a different choice, his most underrated song of the 1980s? Mm, best song. So this, here's the danger here. I can try to be hipper than thou or tell the truth. Tell the I truth. encourage truth telling on this. Okay. Best song, Modern Love. Okay, good uh, choice. Yeah. Not Tom my choice, but I I won't say no to that one. It's it it's it's an obvious choice because it's the right choice. Thank it's you. Just, <laughs> that's, that's one of those in terms of like sort of like setting the historical scene. It's one of the songs that I heard for the first time in a record store because what you did was you hung out in a record store hoping they would play the new records, and. So I was in a, a record store in Boston in, in March 83 when that record came out and was in a room full of people who are pretending to be just jaded, just browsing, but like everybody's hearing modern love for the first time. And you, there's a sense like total strangers are looking at each other like, it, are you hearing what I'm hearing? This song is phenomenal. It just keeps building, building, still gives me that thrill. Modern love, you're right. It's, it's not the hippest, coolest, edgiest choice. But it's the best. Lindsay. I would say Ashes to Ashes, which is one of my favorite songs. And also, how can we not forget how wonderfully it was referenced on The Young Ones, John, in the funeral scene where Rick, the people's poet, just starts singing it in the middle of a funeral. It's the best. I would say Ashes to Ashes. And 
uh, I didn't plan a response to this, but in terms of most underrated song, I'd actually go with This Is Not America. I don't think people tend to remember that song. And it's interesting to think, you know, it was a song with Pat Metheny because, of course, David Bowie ended his entire career on a very high note with, you know, and the amazing Black Star record, which was a jazz record for them, you know, with jazz musicians. So sort of through line there. Do any of you have any, um, you know, underrated songs i don't think modern love is probably underrated i don't think people necessarily hold it up in the canon of his uh, that it should be in but it, like a song that's like a deeper cut of the 80s underrated single loving the alien okay underrated song teenage wildlife okay. it's just epic in scope yeah just great song yeah rob uh <laughs> Up the Hill Backwards, yeah. which is a song that's so different from anything else he did. He doesn't have any other, you know, other songs that sound like that musically or lyrically. And it, it sounds like he's singing pretty straightforwardly to his kid while, you know, like going through a divorce. It's just really incredibly different musically, emotionally, in every way, vocally. Unbelievably beautiful song. And, and from a period where he was so on a roll that he could just put a song like that casually just like toss it away on on uh, scary monsters but fantastic i will actually say i'm gonna go here's my hot take my only hot take i will actually say that dancing for blue jean is an underrated song that song is actually good i'm not saying it's his best great song, great song. i'm just saying I, like it's a I, good song i bought the 45 on translucent blue vinyl wow very cool to match to match screaming lord byron's face Yes. Very nicely done. And so, I, so, so Rob, you mentioned Criminal World. I'm a huge, huge, huge fan. Huge fan of Metro. Huge fan of Peter Godwin. Who was God bless like, Peter Godwin getting some cash. Unbelievable. Images of Heaven, like oh. one of the truly great non-Bowie Bowie songs of a decade. That, was, that, was, to, that song just slays me. Um, Criminal World, it's, it's also, it's one that you can put on a tape in between two songs. And before people recognize it, they're like, wow, this sounds really great. This sounds like David Bowie. It's a Bowie song. Yeah. Our criminal world. I just love that song. Great. Amazing. So well, Lindsay, if I do get credit for holding out to the very end of this before showing my my dark star, my black star. You have a black star tattoo. <laughs> wow, that's huge. It's like your whole arm. Amazing. Yeah, that's I love David Bowie. I'm so that's happy we got to, I got to have this conversation with you. I will actually, since you are a special guest and you wrote, you literally wrote the book on Bowie, Rob. It's hard to sum up the 80s in one sentence or one hot take, as it were, because Bowie in the 80s, much like Bowie in any decade, was not one thing. But if you were to sum up, Bowie's career in the 80s, what would you, how would you describe it? I would describe it as putting out fire <laughs> with gasoline. <laughs> that's, what yes. he, that's what he spent the 80s doing. <laughs> nobody, Perfect. nobody can do that like him. That's why you are the contributing editor editor at Rolling Stone. That's why you're one of the greatest music journalists working today. And that is why you are the author of On Bowie and not me, because you summed it up so perfectly with perfect words. Thank you, Rob, for so much for your time. Thank your you. This was Thank so you. much, so much fun. You're welcome. You know, I have a feeling there may be some other 80s things that we'll talk about in the future. That oh, yeah, you you're screwed now. You're coming back all the time. You're coming oh, back oh, next. Yes. You're coming back next week. I, on, Another we'll man trap episode. <laughs> we'll do a whole ABC episode for you. Yes, absolutely. Oh it, it, <laughs> it it is a date. Until then, I'm Lindsay Parker. I've been joined by John Hughes and Rob Sheffield. We want to thank you for listening. Remember to give us a rate and review on your favorite podcast platform, and we'll catch you next time. This was Totally Eighties. The podcast dedicated to the music of the greatest decade ever. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Totally 80s. And please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Until our next episode, catch you on the flip side.